Good morning, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Lab 207 Webcast. My name is Mr. Kite, and I'll be hanging out with you today as we continue on in our series about water. Topic for the day is going to be water pollution, specifically metals, chemicals, and oil. So as always, let me get you some objectives, and we'll get going. Really, the title for the first slide gave you your objectives for the day. By the end of this video, you'll be able to describe the sources and impacts of multiple types of water pollution. So this whole video is just going to be moving through specific types of water pollution. We're going to talk about their sources and their effects, and then that'll be it. So to kind of prime your brain before we get going, the categories of water pollution we're going to talk about are heavy metals, chemicals, and petroleum. So starting out with the heavy metals. First up, we've got lead. Now, I am sure that you have heard about lead contamination in water, you know, at some point in your school career. A couple major things that you need to know. Um, lead is not generally naturally occurring in water, so if there is lead contamination, it's probably coming from lead pipes or pipe fittings or the solder on those pipes. Um, as far as what it does, it is a neurotoxin, so it harms the brain, the nervous system, and the kidneys, particularly of babies and older generations. So first heavy metal to know about is lead. Get it out of pipes. It's hard on the nervous system. Second one to know about is arsenic. Now where lead is not naturally occurring, arsenic is naturally occurring. It's found in rock, generally bedrock. Most of the arsenic in water supplies does come from naturally occurring rock. It is a carcinogen, which means that it causes multiple types of cancer. Now, good news on arsenic is that it is removable through filtration processes. However, mining and other um, industries that disturb rock and bedrock tend to release quite a bit of arsenic into water supplies because they expose that bedrock. The water then runs over it, dissolves the arsenic, and carries that arsenic downstream. Next up on the hit parade is going to be mercury, beautiful mercury. Things that you need to know about mercury. Um, mercury in its inorganic form, just naturally occurring in the environment, is actually not harmful. But once it's in the environment, bacteria convert it into a form called methylmercury. Methylmercury is a very strong, very dangerous neurotoxin. Most of the mercury that is found in the environment that is harmful to us is released through the burning of fossil fuels, especially coal. Um, when coal is burned, it releases a ton of mercury. Gasoline and other oils also release mercury too when they are burned. So basically what happens is those fuels are burned, the mercury is released into the atmosphere. Once it's in the atmosphere, Whenever it rains or snows, that mercury is carried from the atmosphere down into waterways. Once it's into the waterway, it enters the food chain. And then, as we have talked about in a previous video, it goes through uh, biomagnification, which is the idea that as a chemical moves up the f food chain, it becomes more concentrated. This is one of the reasons that they talk a lot about limiting your seafood intake, especially uh, intake of top predator fish like swordfish or tuna or something like that, is because they can contain very high levels of mercury that they have consumed throughout their life. Mercury can also make it into the environment through the mining process. Um, mercury can be used in the process of extracting gold from rock and sediment. So know that mercury found in the environment releases the mining process, but also and most frequently through the burning of fossil fuels. Right, we're going to move from our heavy metals into actual chemicals. First one we're talk about is acid deposition and acid mine drainage. Acid deposition is more commonly known as acid rain. And very quickly, the way that acid rain forms is a process you should be aware of. Um, you have got the burning of fuels, again, usually coal, sometimes oil. The burning of those fuels releases sulfates, SO2, and nitrous oxide. So these are going to be known as SOX and NOx. Once these guys are into the atmosphere, they mix with the uh, water vapor that makes a cloud. Once they mix with that water vapor in the cloud, they form sulfuric acid and nitric acid. Both of those acids then fall as rain. And that rain usually is going to have a pH well below 5. And so once it gets into the environment, it can do significant amounts of damage. So it can lower the pH of water, which obviously is going to be very hard on organisms living in that water. 
Um, once water becomes acidic, it can cause rocks that are in that waterway to release other harmful metals into the uh, waterway, such as lead and aluminum. And also, obviously, acid rain falling on vegetation is going to kill vegetation over time. So know how acid deposition forms or how acid precipitation forms and the effects. The other one you need to know about is acid mine drainage. And this occurs when a mine has been abandoned. So a mine is dug, it's left as an empty pit. That empty pit fills up with either naturally occurring groundwater or precipitation. As that water sits in that mine, it reacts with a mineral called pyrite. When pyrite interacts with water and air at the same time, it breaks down to form ions, and that's going to cause the water to become acidic. It also forms iron. So this uh, acid water that is found in mines can then drain off into waterways and groundwater and lower the pH of that water, thus harming the ecosystem in significant ways. So no acid deposition and no acid mine drainage. Then we've got our pesticides and inert ingredients. So pesticides are kind of a no-brainer. They are chemicals that are built to kill things. Usually they act on the nervous systems of bugs, but once those are in the environment, they can have all kinds of uh, effects. One is that they are indiscriminate, meaning that pesticides can be sprayed for a particular pest, but that pesticide is designed to kill things. So it's gonna kill many bugs, good, bad, and otherwise. Um, another thing to know about pesticides is that they can be neurotoxins. Also, you should know that sometimes they have unintended consequences. They might be built for the nervous system of a pest, but as they move through the food chain, as is the case with DDD, DDT, they can impact the eggshell forming capabilities of birds. So they can have effects that wouldn't normally be associated with them. And then something else you need to know about pesticides is that they have got inert ingredients. Now you hear that word inert and you think, oh, that means that it's harmless. Interesting thing is, is that a lot of pesticides have got these ingredients in them known as inert ingredients that are not on their face value intended to kill whatever the target organism is. They rather help the pesticide to do its job, whether it is helping the pesticide to get into the organism, helping the herbicide get into the plant, helping that thing to dissolve in water, whatever. Those inert ingredients themselves can be highly toxic, but because they're classified as inert ingredients, they are not often regulated. So they can be a big problem, especially for amphibians. A lot of the inert ingredients found in pesticides are actually highly toxic to amphibians. So pesticides and inert ingredients going to move us on into pharmaceuticals. And I would say that pharmaceuticals is not a type of pollution that's often thought about. But recent tests has found that upwards of like 90% of American streams and rivers have some sort of pharmaceutical in them. The way that pharmaceuticals generally get into the water supply is, well, from the home. So if you have got people in the home who are taking birth control pills, when they urinate, some of those chemicals are going to be released into the sewage system. A lot of people flush old uh, pills down the drain, so that's going to put them into the water system. Also, we have got you know mass farming operations, CAFO feedlots, that give significant amounts of pharmaceuticals to animals. And then when those animals urinate or defecate, that makes it into the waterway as well. Biggest concern with pharmaceuticals is that they can often mimic hormones and become endocrine disruptors, which means that Animals that are exposed to these chemicals over time may see things such as sterility. You might have sex change in amphibians and fish where you get males start producing female eggs. So um, the big overarching impacts of pharmaceuticals in waterways are unknown. It's something that's just now starting to be re researched and is starting to come to light. So expect to hear more about this topic over time. And we're going to finish up our chemical section with industrial compounds. Now, industrial compounds are any compounds that are used in manufacturing processes, and there are hundreds of them. Sadly, for much of the 1900s, especially in America and parts of Europe, industrial chemicals were just dumped into the river because, you know, the people who owned those factories thought, oh, river flows away, it'll take all this stuff away, so we'll just dump it in the river, and then it'll carry out into the ocean. We won't have to worry about it. Because of this practice, many rivers in America became so contaminated that no fish could live in them, people could not swim in them, and in some cases, such as the Cuyahoga River in Ohio, which you can see there, they became so contaminated that they actually caught fire. Now, when you've got water that can catch fire, you know you've got a problem. So all of these contaminated rivers and the burning of the Cuyahoga River 
prompted some fairly strict water quality legislation that has since led to a significant reduction in the amount of pollution in American waterways. There are some industrial chemicals to be aware of, though you need to know about PCBs, which are used in the manufacture of uh, plastics and insulators. They are a significant carcinogen that is still being found in water. They are extremely persistent. So even though companies have stopped using them or stopped putting them in waterways, they can still be found because they hang out in the water for quite a while. And we're going to wrap up with oil. Now, I would say that when people think of water pollution, oil is the first thing that comes to their brain. And it's the, because it's like big, it's visible, you got black oil slicks all over the place, you got catastrophic explosions. Oil is generally what comes to mind. So a couple things to know about. Oil spills do put a significant amount of oil into our environment. Big ones to know about that we've talked about already are BP Horizon and the Exxon Valdez. But a couple of the things that I want to note is that most oil that makes it into waterways is actually the result of water washing that oil off of streets and sidewalks on the land and then carrying it downstream into the ocean. Um, there is a significant amount of oil that makes it into the environment through oil spills, but most of it is actually runoff. And another interesting thing is that oil naturally seeps into the environment. So where oil deposits are close to the surface of the earth, they will actually seep out. And something like half of the oil that ends up in American waterways on a yearly basis is actually the result of natural oil seeps underground. But environmental damage from a big scale oil spill is obviously a huge problem. You have got the oil itself, which is going to kill almost any organism that it comes into contact with and covers. It's going to kill most of the algae and plankton in an area because either they're going to be poisoned or they will no longer be able to get sunlight. Um, you've got that oil that gets into rocks and sediments and hangs out on shorelines for a long time. So Oil spills are bad, we know this. The uh, BP Horizon oil spill is still having really significant impacts on the fishing industry in the Gulf of Mexico. So because oil spills are such a big problem, you should know some things about remediation. Remediation means to clean up or to make better. And some of the strategies that are used, if the oil is on the surface of the water, one of the strategies that cleanup crews will use is they've got these big ships that have got oil vacuums on them and essentially they stick a hose over the side of the ship and they vacuum up the oil just like you would vacuum your carpet. So that would be one strategy. When they do that, that mix of water and oil that comes into the ship, the oil is removed from the water and then the water is pumped back out. They also employ booms which are basically big floating pipes that have got like skirts that hang down from them. These booms surround the oil spill and since oil is lighter than water and floats on the top, these booms will contain the oil in one area. And another strategy that they use, and this was used pretty extensively in the BP Horizon spill, is dispersants. So dispersants are chemicals that when sprayed over the top of an oil slick, they will cause that oil to break up and disperse into the water. Now, thing to note, this doesn't make the oil actually go away. It just breaks it up so it's not necessarily visible. Um, it's also been found that many dispersants are really environmentally harmful, and also they are harmful to people. So they make the oil spill look like it's better, but whether it actually makes it better or not, is still unknown. Another interesting strategy that they use is bacteria. So there are naturally occurring bacteria that derive their energy from breaking down oil. Scientists are currently working on how to genetically modify or engineer and grow bacteria that can be used to break down oil spills. So if there were an oil spill, they could spread these bacteria in the water and the bacteria would just naturally eat the oil and get rid of it. So I think that's kind of a cool strategy. Last two things I want to mention as we wrap up. Um, sometimes oil spills occur below the surface and above the surface. So we saw this with the BP spill. There was the oil you saw on top of the surface, but then down below the surface there was what was called an oil plume, which is a mixture of oil and water. It's kind of like salad dressing. And oil plumes just travel underneath the surface of the water. So it's possible that a company may clean up the surface of the water, but then if you were to go down deep into the ocean, you would find these big plumes of oil running around down there. And then also, once the oil makes it onto a coastline, it's extremely hard to clean up. It gets down into the sand, it wraps around the rocks, it gets in all of, all of the crevices. We are now more than 20 years removed from the BP oil spill, not the BP oil spill, the Exxon Valdez spill. And still, if you dig pits in the sand at Prince William Sound, you will find oil below that sand. So once oil is in the environment, it stays there for a long time. And with these big spills, we still are not necessarily aware of all of the environmental impacts that are going to come out of them. So 
that's it. I would recommend going back, making sure that you know each of the types of water pollution that I just talked about. Make sure that you know about oil spills and some of these strategies that are used to clean them up. I appreciate you joining us on the Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. Kite. Hopefully we'll see you again.